others can also know this. So it's, it's uh, about algorithms. We will have several parts related to algorithms, and we have them in this summary here. I think in the other courses, like uh, CMPS 200 or ECE 230, um, you are learning about uh, programming with Python, I think. Python, yes. Okay? Which is one of the programming languages, um, famous programming languages that are used actually in, in real software. Um, but when you write a certain sequence of instructions to solve a certain problem, you are following a certain procedure or algorithm okay, to solve that problem. And solving that problem, this is what is important. It's not important to know how to transcode. Okay? I would call it programming or transcoding only, not problem solving. So transcoding a certain idea that is written in English, let's say, or pseudocode, like almost code, resembling to code, okay? a certain English description of a certain procedure um, that the computer know how to, knows how to perform, um, is just, it is a good skill. It is a required skill. It is an essential skill to know the syntax of your programming language, to know how to transcode a certain program in Python. Okay? Um, but you won't be hired only for that in software development company. Okay? So you will be hired for problem solving skills. Okay? Uh, if you know how to solve a certain um, uh, problem using whatever programming language, okay? So we don't care about the programming language almost, okay? So we are going to talk about this. We are going to talk about the most famous algorithms, um, and specifically those related to searching in a certain array for a value, sorting a certain array, because these are the formula one uh, games for algorithms, okay, to come up with new ideas. Um, and then we will start one step further towards um, talking about the complexity of algorithms, starting by uh, the notion of growth of functions, okay, and then with classes of complexities of algorithms, okay. So today we are going to just cover the first part, the introduction to algorithms a certain pseudocode um, um, language that you are going to agree on it, okay? So that you can in the final exam and we can understand you, okay? Regardless uh, whether you know Python or not. So we're going to use that specific language, a pseudocode language. And we are going to use it to solve a couple of uh, famous exercises that you may uh, already know how to solve, search problems and sorting problems that you already uh, did in Python, okay? And I'm going to do certain, um, um, I will command these uh, algorithms to go one step further towards uh, talking about the time complexity and the space complexity of algorithms, okay? What do we mean by complexity? So when you run a certain algorithm, it takes a, a certain amount of time, okay? So um, this depends on the hardware that you are using. Maybe on an i3 uh, uh, computer, it takes five seconds on an i7 computer, it takes only one second, okay? So it depends on your hardware. But even if you run it on the fastest computer, okay? So you take algorithm number one and a completely different algorithm number two that solves the same type of problems. It means they take the same set of inputs and they give you the right output for them. Um, you can find different types of algorithms um, that really behave differently even if they are run on the same i3 machine or on the same i7 machine, okay? So imagine you fix the machine and you change the algorithm, then you can gain in time. And it's important to be able to solve large problems of uh, large input of, of that type of problems, okay? Because you have, I don't know, like uh, 7,000 students. So it's interesting to check your algorithm, how it's doing on 7,000 entries to sort them alphabetically, let's say, okay? Not only on 10 or 15 input, okay, values. So we are interested in this. To, we want to, to be able to make a good friendship suggestion algorithm on Facebook while we are having 3 billion users on the database, okay? So it's a very large graph, it's a very large database, and we want to make a good algorithm for, for it, 
Okay? So let's do the first steps. So you have a very nice video that you can watch. Uh, I think I don't have the right equipment here to, um, to uh, hear it, but we can just check the, um, the images in it. So I think... Um, let me click on the link. I will remove it afterwards. <laughs> okay. So you have the link for uh, for good on um, on the slides, and here they are just explaining the idea of um, how an algorithm uh, would proceed. So if you want to count a certain number of uh, persons in a certain room, then you would proceed. Um, sequentially by, come, by adding in your head one each time you are pointing towards one of the uh, um, uh, people present there in, in that room. So as if you were defining a certain counter, initializing it in your head to zero, and then uh, for each person in the room, you are repeating the same procedure, you are pointing to that person, and then you are adding one to that uh, counter in your head. So one, two, three, four. Sometimes if you want to go I think you did this plenty of time in your exercises, programming exercises. So sometimes if you want to go quickly on um, this task, then you may count uh, um, the persons by pairs, actually. You can, you can pinpoint to each pair of students and then count um, like two, four, six, eight, and then you, you could count one row um, in, in the three iterations or four iterations. So it's, it's much faster. Um, nevertheless, if you do this algorithm and you increment for each pair of students, you increment your counter by two, then sometimes you, at the end of the row, maybe you still have one student left and you didn't count that student. Nevertheless, your algorithm don't, doesn't know how to count that single uh, student. So, and this is what happens usually when you try to make your algorithm smarter or, or you want to actually combine known algorithms to solve a new problem, okay? So you have to always pay attention to run it in your head, to debug it, okay? And to check whether it, it gives you the right output for the various inputs that you may have. So here the solution clearly is to uh, put a special condition um, so that when you are left with one person at the end, if one person remains, then you have to add one to your total, okay? Otherwise, when you, you are counting an odd number of students or persons in the room, then um, uh, you would have a wrong result. And this leads us to one um, uh, crucial concept in algorithms, is to write a uh, correct algorithm. So when you write an algorithm, you have to check it whether it is um, uh, sound or correct with respect to your original problem. So does it solve the problem? Okay. And does it solve it for whatever input? Okay? Pick up whatever algorithm you wrote so far. I can find eventually tiny bugs in it. Okay? Uh, because you didn't check, for example, you are reading one integer, another integer, and you are summing them up. This is maybe the very first algorithm that you learned. Um, have you checked whether these 
timed values entered by the end user, whether they are really integers or text? Ah, no, okay? So, so even that algorithm or program, you have to go and to fix it once again to, to check for such conditions, okay? What if they entered a very, very long integer, okay, that, that is not representable on 32 bits, okay? I don't know if you have been told about the representation of data in binary. So everything is uh, limited. All the resources on your computer are limited, in, like mainly the, the, the memory, okay? So this is why um, we are working with um, uh, limited sizes of uh, data chunks, 32 bits for integers, 64 bits for long integers, okay? And you will always find a certain upper bound on the uh, um, largest number that you can represent in memory, okay? And one of the exercises that has been uh, asked in one of the programming competitions, okay? Uh, maybe you know about the ICPC, International Collegiate Programming Contest, one of the most prestigious uh, programming competitions. Um, and AUB students do very well in this competition. So. Um, usually you have 80 problems, you have very limited time, you have few hours to do, to do the task and uh, the, the uh, programming t various programming tasks. You can get prizes for solving one of the problems, being the first to solve it. Um, but if you submit a wrong code or a code that does, does not run, you'll get penalties. So you have all the interest to write good code from the beginning. Uh, and to test it, okay, several times before submitting it. It will be corrected automatically by a machine. So, um, they had a very simple exercise to divide two numbers, okay, and to display the result of the, the quotient and the remainder in one of the competitions. They didn't believe that this is one of the exercises. They, they had this feeling that there is a trick in it. And they started submitting this to get rid of this very easy exercise, and they got very um, uh, um, awkward results from the server, telling them that there are errors until one of the groups uh, noticed that the number might be very, 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 very large, okay? So, and at that moment, the slash operator won't work anymore, and defining a long integer won't work anymore. You have to read the sequence of digits as a string by chunks, converting them to integers, dividing them as you do when you were in the first grade, and then by chunks, okay, and then doing this progressively. Okay, and it happened to be a very difficult problem because the slash operator with two integers or two real numbers doesn't work in this case, okay? And sometimes you have precision problems with a floating point notation or double notation. So sometimes writing an algorithm and testing it for every case, um, a possible case of input in the word is really a tough task. Okay, so let's do some uh, overview. Uh, to agree just on the definition. I'm going to go quickly on this part, um, and after the break, we're going to focus on the um, famous search and sorting uh, problems. So an algorithm, my best preferred definition is a step-by-step -step procedure to solve a certain problem, okay? It can be um, cooking recipe is, is, a, is a, an algorithm somehow, okay? Um, um, I don't know, like do, doing your daily tasks, okay? You have to put algorithms to this. You have to organize your life. So we love to do this, and it has been called uh, this way after Al-Khwarizmi, who did plenty um, uh, of work on number theory and algebra to, and proposed certain ways of um, uh, solving real life problems um, using simple steps. Um, so, Example, describe an algorithm for finding the maximum value in a finite sequence of integers. As a human being, it would be very simple. Just look at the sequence, if you can do it, and keep in your head the biggest number, okay? You do it very roughly, usually, okay? And if there is a hidden number or a number that is written in a different color, sometimes you don't notice it, okay? So we do things this way. We do it quite randomly. We do it in a very smart way, okay? Um, and we know that if we are wrong, it's not a big deal, okay? If it is a number that we should absolutely be sure of, 
otherwise there will be a nuclear explosion, then maybe we will write them down correctly on a paper and okay, very, very um, uh, precisely. So computers um, do what you tell them to do, okay? And they are very rigorous on that, okay? But they are not smart at all. So you have to be careful when you do this. So you should know that computers know only very basic um, uh, instructions. And I should tell you about this secret because this explains also why do we have plenty of programming languages, yet they share the same properties, okay? In all the programming languages, you can define variables of a certain type. You can put values in them. You can read that value back. You can do something with it. You can apply arithmetic opera operations on it, um, logical operations on it, and then you can combine the results, put them back in a certain memory slot, okay, or display it on a certain output device, for example, the screen, okay? So this is all what we do all the time. And this is because um, inside the computer, what you have as instructions are uh, load a certain value from the memory and put it in a certain register within your processor or CPU, okay? So you, you, you load a certain memory slot and you put it in a certain register, okay? You can load another one, let's say. So you can load another memory slot and put it in another register. You can add them, okay? Know, know that a register is like a memory slot, but it's inside your CPU, and the CPU does not have hands to work with the memory. It works only locally, okay? Um, it's like when you load a certain book, okay, from your library and another one, you put them on your table, and you start copying text from one and the other or analyzing them to write a certain essay. So you only work on your desk. You cannot work while standing in front of the, uh, your, your library. So you add both registers and you put the result in a third one. Now you can compare this um, register with zero, let's say, or you can compare it with another register. Okay, whether it's greater than, less than, and so on and so forth. And based on this fact, you can make a certain jump. And this is what makes loops, conditions, if else, loops, for loops, while loops. And this is what also makes um, uh, what we call function calls. So everything else you can do other than doing sequential instructions, add, subtract, multiply, and so on and so forth, is due to this very uh, um, wonderful instruction called a jump, okay? There is a conditional jump, jump only when this value is greater than zero to that instruction, or jump when it is uh, less than zero to that, to that instruction. This is what you do with an if-else, okay? And the same thing happens when you do a for loop or a while loop. Um, and there is an unconditional jump. This happens when you call a certain function. You tell the, the CPU, the processor, please jump to that instruction called max, okay? Because I want to call that function now. I want to execute the instructions of that function. And the return, do you have a return statement in your functions? So the return statement in your function is also a, an unconditional jump to return back to the main uh, function and to call the other instructions in it, okay? So, um, what else? So we have load, add, compare, and then jump, and eventually you will have a store to store back the final results in a certain memory cell, okay? You can also have output uh, to a certain device, input from a keyboard, and so on and so forth, okay? So you should know that only 12 or maybe 16 in different instructions are understandable by your uh, machine, okay? All the rest is all the richness that you have in C++, in Python, is just a sugar-added syntax to do um, a human task, to iterate on a certain number of items in, 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 array, in an array, okay? Or to call a certain, to group a certain of instructions in a function, okay? And you call it max, and you call it every time you want, okay? And so on and so forth. Is, is it clear for these uh, explanations? Yeah. Uh, just one thing, is the instruction set contained within the CPU or within the memory? Uh, the, you mean the definition of, of these or the, the, instructions, the instructions that are written for a specific program? Uh, for the, for the, CPU. Uh, the CPU itself, 
everything um, that you see here, so all the instructions, are um, defined with a certain key, a binary key. So load actually must be written in the memory as 001001, let's say, okay? And so it's stored like that in, in the RAM, and this combination goes inside the um, architecture of the CPU, and it simply triggers in a certain component called multiplexer or chooser, okay? It triggers automatically the circuit that must load a certain value, or it triggers the circuit that must add two different values, and so on and so forth. Yeah, yeah. So there is no lookup table. There is no um, uh, code anymore. There is no text. Everything is binary in the CPU. Okay, and you will learn it in computer architecture courses, uh, operating system courses, assembly courses, and so on and so forth. So this is why it won't work in a this rough or random way. You have to be systematic in what you do. So. Um, Sometimes I give my students this example. So imagine that you want to uh, know the um, eldest uh, student who is in the dorms. But imagine that you have only one room, okay? So you are the CPU, you only have one room, and you can call them only one by one, okay? So you have to put on a piece of paper the age of each student. So you call the, one, the, the first student who is living in the room number one. Maybe he is 20 years old. So you will mark on a post-it or piece of paper in your register, in your live memory, you will write down 20. And then you will call the next student. You don't see the others, okay? So you don't see the other values. The CPU does this. It loads a certain value from the memory and it puts it locally in a certain register and then calls the next value, and so on and so, and so forth. So even if you have an array, you cannot see all of them. The same happens here. So I have 100 students in front of me. So I, I cannot look at all of you and, I don't know, uh, tell who's the tallest, okay? So I, I, I need really to, to, if I want to, the accurate results, so I have to, to do a certain um, sorting, uh, systematic sorting uh, algorithm to get the finest result. So imagine that the CPU has that room and calls the values one by one, okay? And each time you call a certain student, you mark down the, the age of that student. If the age is less than what you got so far, let's say it's less than 20, you ignore that value. Okay, thank you, please call the next student. When the next student comes to that uh, office, if the student has 22 or 23, it's greater than 20, then you will, you will wipe the previous value and you will add the, the new value to your piece of paper. Okay, and so on and so forth until you finish all the rooms. Okay, so you have to be systematic. And the um, the instructor from um, uh, from MIT who um, is actually David uh, Mellon, who who is offering a course called CS 150. It's a very famous course on on edX on edX. Um, so you can you can watch him. Uh, demonstrating how algorithms work uh, in a very nice way when he asked his students to uh, propose a way to put a uh, peanut butter and uh, to make a peanut butter and uh, a jam sandwich. So, like, suppose I have two jars of peanut butters uh, and, and jam here, and I have, like, a tile of uh, 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 bread here. So give me instructions to do it. Uh -huh. Okay, I took the bread. Okay, thank you. Put it in the jam. Put in the jam, okay. So, okay. Take it back. I have to take it back, okay. Put it on the sandwich. Put on the sandwich, okay. Okay, so you see, if, I, if we don't agree on what I can do, okay, and what you mean by each instruction, there will be a misunderstanding, okay? And this is what happens. This is why you get um, uh, some errors by, uh, by your compiler, okay? It's not nasty. It's simply because the compiler only understands one way of doing things, okay? So you have to go down to the level of your compiler and to know the syntax of it, okay? Um, so, and yeah, so, so if you are teaching me, human being, to do a sandwich. You will just say, please make me 10 sandwiches for these guys, okay? And you will go, okay? And then 
and maybe this is a sort of procedure, is that there's a function that you already defined in me when I was a kid, okay? But for an alien, you have to be very careful. Please take this tool called a knife and put it in this jar, okay? And, and you will go very slowly with the instructions. And this is what we should learn to do with uh, programming languages, okay? Good, so when you watch the video, you get all the details. Um, how to specify algorithms? So usually if we can use English language, we can use uh, a more strict, uh, stricter English language with a specific meaning for each word in it. We call it pseudocode, uh, yet it's still generic, it's still abstract, it's a high level language that uh, is not related to any programming language, or we can use code. Um, we can also use, instead of pseudocode, what we call flowchart. This is nice to investigate. Um, you can uh, search for this term. With the flowchart, we have basic uh, visual diagrams, okay, and visual objects to denote each type of instructions. So parallelogram to read input from the user, L shapes to display something on the screen, boxes in which we write any instruction we want, basic instructions such as adding items uh, together, subtracting, multiplying, and so on and so forth, to do some processing, okay? So, um, the pseudo code language that we are gonna agree on is the following. We're gonna use the, the keyword, the procedure, all the keywords, so we're gonna use the word the procedure to define a function or a procedure. By the way, what's the difference between a procedure and a function? Procedure is a set of steps. Yeah. Function is not steps, it's just assigning the variable. Function is a set of procedure. No. Yes. Procedure is a set of procedure. Um, so I'm gonna give you two examples. Uh, the first one takes in a certain integer n, okay, and returns back the uh, square of n. It's, function. it's a function. It's like mathematical functions. Uh, another one takes a value n and displays on the screen n stars sequentially. It's a procedure. It, it does not return anything back. Okay, even if you have to define it in your programming language with a return void or return nothing or return with semicolon to say that it returns nothing, okay, even if it is mandatory, mandatory to write the return statement, usually you write without anything. So we write return nothing, return void, return semicolon, okay, so return period, so that's it. So, um, so usually procedures are uh, um, um, compound statements that you want to call to, to do something repetitively, and they do not return anything back to you, okay? If they return something back, then they are usually called functions, okay? And certain programming languages, uh, such as object-oriented programming languages, such as C++ and Java, they call all of these uh, types of procedures or functions, they call them methods, okay? So just methods as a generic name. Good. So we're gonna use the word the procedure to denote any type of these instructions. So whether we have the return expression here as, uh, as, as here or without a uh, return statement. A procedure has a name and it has a sequence of arguments. Each argument must have a name and a type. When you call a certain procedure, you just write its name and you pass the arguments to it, okay? So um, you can define a procedure called max and it takes x as an integer and uh, let's use integer this way and y as an integer. Then when you call your um, uh, procedure, you just write max of three comma four, okay? You pass in two arguments, three and four, two values, three comma four, okay? So I think you are used to this notation, okay? No, yes? Good. Uh, you can define a variable in this way by assigning a value to it. The value can be any expression. It can be a constant, like an integer of, uh, uh, or a decimal value, or it can be 
any other complex expression that returns a value at the end. Okay? For example, you can put in a certain variable m, you can assign to it, and to assign things here we use uh, colon equal. Okay? Just to say that we are assigning a value to that variable. It's not the mathematical equality. Okay? So assigning to m the value of max of 4 and 15, okay? So uh, it can be really any expression. It can be the call of another function. We can also add to this 3, for example. In this case, m will be equal to 18, to 18 if max is correctly programmed, okay? Um, so we can write any informal statement on one single line. So for example, uh, we can write like swap all the values in this array with values from the other array, okay? Usually we have to write down the code for this, but if you want to make your code shorter, then you can write, in pseudocode, you can write any uh, compound statement in one single line, okay? Uh, just to make things simpler. In, in programming languages, we cannot do this. Usually we do this with, in, in commands, okay? So, uh, which are defined here. So, in our pseudocode language, we are gonna use braces to put, um, uh, some documentation on our code, okay? If you want to put a block of statements, then we have to put begin and end. Uh, usually this happens with indentation in Python, with the braces in Java and C Sharp and C++. The if a statement, very famous uh, and useful statement, so you can put if a certain condition, then execute that statement, and eventually, optionally, you can put an else block. Okay, if you don't put an else block, then nothing happens if the condition is, is false, okay? Only when the condition is true, the statement is executed. The condition can be any comparison of values, okay? Any logical expression, okay? Um, to write four statements, we are gonna use an initial value for a certain variable, uh, typically it's a counter, uh, to the final value, execute that statement. And you know maybe already that the for statement is a shorthand for while statements. Everything you can write with for, you can write with why, okay? The inverse is not true in certain programming languages, uh, although in C, C++, and Java, it is also true because the for statements, you can write complex conditions in it, okay? One example, you, so typically the for statement is for counters, even if you are counting uh, two steps or three steps at once, okay? While the student is um, um, like um, younger than that age and did not, the number of credits he or she took is less than that thing and today is not a Tuesday and the computer battery is heat is, okay? So you can, you can put whatever condition you want, okay? A for statement is really meant to be used for counting things, okay? Is it fine for you? Maybe it's boring? A little bit, it's fine. So it's good, it's good to review, and just to agree on the syntax. So a while statement, you can put whatever condition here, and then you can put statements there. So please just remember one last thing about conditions. You can write a simple condition that returns a true or false, and you can combine conditions with Boolean uh, uh, connectives, okay? With and, or, not, and so on and so forth, okay? Good? Perfect. So here you have the details. For example, um, to define a procedure, you can call it maximum, and you can define L being a list of integers, okay? Uh, typically, we would like to explicit this list of integers. Um, so more precisely, we would write A1, comma, A2, three dots, AN is a list of integers, or sequence of integers, okay? So yes, this is allowed in this course. We don't really care about the exact syntax that you would use to define an array in C or in Python or whatever other language, okay? Um, and please guys, do not feel um, obsessed by this pseudocode, okay? So you don't have, we want, we want lunch on okay? So we only care about the idea of the algorithm, okay? So express it in whatever way, you can call it a sequence of uh, integers, you can, go very quickly if it is the exam sick of integers. It's not here the, the problem, okay? So we are really interested in what you will be writing down inside your uh, procedure, okay? 
And you will also have another type of exercises where we are giving you the code, you have to understand it, and you have to tell, tell us whether the code is correct or not, whether, um, and you can prove this logically, and whether the, um, the code that is written is efficient or not to compare it to another code. So we are more interested in the core business, not in the syntax, okay? Yes. Yeah, but we are going to use the keyword procedure here in this syntax to denote procedures and or functions, okay? So interchangeably, we are going to use the same keyword to define a procedure or a function, okay? If it is a procedure, then just don't write return at the end. It's legal, okay? If it is a function, then write return at the end. Yeah. A function cannot be assigned to a variable. If it just, yeah. Uh, yeah, I agree with you. So very good point. If you have a procedure, let's say, let's call this procedure copy from to and you give two arguments to it, a first file name and the second file name. And this procedure uh, goes to the first file, it opens it, and then it copies its content to the second file, okay? So this is a typical procedure, not, it's usually not a function. But if in this function you want to check whether the file exists or not, whether the copy process really happened or not, so maybe you want to return it true eventually, whether this copy process really uh, was done cor cor really correctly or not, okay? In this case, it, it becomes a function, and you can, you can put its result in a variable. I totally agree. If it is only a procedure without a return statement, you cannot put the result of this procedure in a variable, okay? It answers your question, I hope. Yeah, good. Um, the assignment uh, statement, I think you know it already. Just Please just get used to the uh, colon equal. We appreciate this in a math course because we don't want to confound this with the equal operator that, that we know uh, in arithmetic. Informal statements can be anything that you assume it's um, uh, feasible by the computer. But if we are asking you to sort the integers in a certain array, uh, and we are asking you to write that algorithm, okay, um, I don't think you will get a grade if you write an informal statement that say, return this array sorted, okay? So because we are really interested in the process of sorting the elements um, um, inside your code, okay? But whenever it happens that you can uh, make it a brief, use this trick. Uh, begin and uh, helps you to define the blocks of code. Especially you need the blocks of code in the following circumstances when you define the body of a certain procedure, when you define the then block or the else block of a certain if statement, um, and in the body of the for or while loop, okay? So just use begin and end to denote the body of uh, these um, uh, sections of your code. Um, good. So curly braces are used instead of begin and end in many languages, but we are keeping them for the uh, uh, comments here, okay? So comments are very useful to explain your code to human beings, okay? Um, eventually when you, yeah. It's better visually for yourself and for the corrector of your exam. It's better to indent them a little bit. So I would say if this condition, okay, then I would write begin here and write my statements and then put an and here, okay, and put else there, okay, and then begin and, okay. I would go further to, to, to put a block here and a block there just to make sure that I'm indenting my code. I like to put these vertical lines, yes. Uh, if they are indented and you put this vertical bar, okay? If you think that it is really clear and the begin and end are really taking a lot of time, then you can get rid of them, okay? But I think for the tiny algorithms that you will be writing during the final exam, it's, it's gonna be okay. 
Yes. Uh, indented, it means that your text has a certain um, uh, additional space um, to the left, okay, of the margin of your code, okay? You do it to push a certain block, okay, uh, inside the scope of your than statement or else statement or while loop, okay? Okay, to know what part of your code or what which statements fall within the scope of your while loop and which statements are within the same scope or the, at the same level of the while loop itself. And they will be executed when you get out of the while loop, okay? It's just a notation. When I put a vertical bar, I will force this indentation, okay? So since on paper we cannot be very precise with our indentation, so put a vertical bar at the end, okay? To denote that indentation, yes? Instead of being can you use I would say, I would say why not, okay? I would say why not, but I'm just afraid that when we correct the exams that one of us would be strict on this, but I, I don't think so, okay? Once again, we will be only strict on the ideas that, that are written inside this. So this is very helpful, the vertical bars, then you can use with this either braces or begin and, okay? You can put B dot and E dot and just explain it the first time. Yes? We follow a, a precise uh, syntax. Not at, not at all. I think it's useless to, to write if and then in a, in a different way. Just keep on these keywords, okay? okay. Um, uh, use braces to put the commands, okay? So just, just follow the syntax that we, are, we were describing a few slides ago, okay? Assignment would be with colon equal, okay? So just respect these tiny details. Uh, currently, it's just a block of code, okay? It's just a block of code. It depends, maybe this is my uh, tiny chunk of a certain algorithm, or if I want to put it in a procedure, then I have to add the uh, keyword, the procedure here, okay? And to write something here, like uh, a certain procedure name, let's call it um, is prime, okay? So this is an is prime function, and if the variable is divisible by something else, it's gonna do something else, it's gonna do something else, yes? If you have multiple if statements, you mean, you mean one after the other or nested? With one after the other, it's, it's not a big, you just write down another if statement here at the same level and then you write down the block within it, okay? But if your if statement is within the scope of another if, okay, so sometimes um, you want to, let's say you have three different integers and you want to display the smallest one of them. Okay, so you're gonna compare the first two. If x is less than y, then you will get inside that block and you will write if y is uh, less than z, then x is the smallest one, else they will compare y, x and z, okay, and so on and so forth. Okay, so within the block, you reset your indentation and you can, you can write an if statement here, okay, with its begin and end, okay? Ah, okay, so you mean uh, the else if uh, statement, okay? So I think you can, you can also use it here, no problem, okay? So you can write right away else and uh, write if after it, okay? It, it would be legal, no problem, okay? I agree that it is not the same thing, okay? An alternative, if you don't have the else, else if, then you would put an else and you would put another if in, inside the else uh, block, okay? But to, as a shorthand, uh, let's say that you have the right to write the else if statement, okay? Yes? Else if is uh, not? Uh, yeah, okay. <coughs> yeah, so in this pseudocode syntax, both of them are defined with the keyword the procedure. Okay, but if you write a return statement at the end to return something based on your input, then it's typically a function, okay? And you can write the name of this function, let's call it max, for example, it takes in two different integers and it returns the one that is the highest value, 
among them. Then in this case, you can put the, the value, the return value of the max function, when you call it, you can put it in a certain third integer, okay? It is the same, yes, absolutely, okay? Um, but if you define, sometimes the students would define a max function that takes in two different values and the function itself displays on the screen which value is the maximum and it does not return anything. In this case, it's just a procedure. When you call it, you cannot put its return value in anything else because it returns void, it returns nothing, okay? Good, yeah. Uh, yeah, I would. Yes. So this is a keyword, okay? This is a keyword: the if, the then, the else, or or else if, the begin and the end. Yes, I totally agree. Okay, this is another if. And actually, special special characters are these braces for the uh, comments. Okay, the braces. Okay. Okay, um, so what about comments? Yes? Yeah, yeah, consider it like, so very nice question. If you have this block of code written within a procedure, okay? If you have, okay guys, this is a very important question. If you have a procedure and you have an if statement in it and your procedure returns Let's say it returns the max, okay? So we would say if x is greater than y, then return x, else return y. This is allowed. You can put in the uh, then state, uh, then a block, you can put a certain return statement. In the else block, you can put another return statement. And in this case, your function would return a certain value at the end, whether it goes within the then uh, block or the else block, okay? Really as you do in typical programming languages, no problem, okay? We have no constraints here. We are just using a different syntax to make an abstraction, regardless of whether the students are learning Python or another language, okay? Just one tiny um, uh, uh, word about commands and, and their usefulness. Uh, they absolutely make your code readable, okay, by human being. They are useless for the execution. We agree. But there is actually another way of um, making your code clear is when you use clear names for your functions and variables, okay? If you write down um, a code with plenty of variables called A, B, C, D, and X, okay, Y, Z, then if you come back two years later on, you won't understand any bit of it, okay? But if you call them uh, the first matrix, the second matrix, the product matrix, okay, then your code will be clearer even if you don't write any comment in it. So when I worked for a couple of years in a software development company, I used to go through uh, certain dark pieces of code that were buggy, and before correcting them, I would try to understand the code and to replace the variable names and the, the method names, but what uh, the previous developers wrote in the comments. So they would, like you have a certain function called pay, but in the comments they would write, Pay only with Visa card and uh, uh, let's say uh, PayPal, okay? Then I would take off the command and put this as the name of the function. Pay with Visa or PayPal, okay? It, it, it becomes my function name and, it become, and I can remove the command in this case, okay? One of the funniest command that I ever read in a piece of code, it, it was a very large piece of code, maybe 1,000 lines of code, and there were, there were plenty of ifs and elses, and in one of the cases, the developer wrote, I don't know if we can even reach this else statement, okay, ever. So, um, so, but it's, it's, so it's always useful, the comments, you can always find a way to, to use them, but using clear variable names and function names is really essential. The if-then statements, we already talked about them, the while loop, traditional, for loop, you know it, but uh, you have initial and final statement. I think you won't need to make um, uh, weird for loops, okay? Because a for loop is by default intended to work um, by incrementing this variable one by one from the initial value to the final value. But just in case in the exercises or on the exam, you need to go two by two values, then you can say step equal to 
uh, two, let's say, okay? Or um, actually within the, within the loop you can say var equal to var plus two manually, okay? So, so, or you can write it as a while loop, by the way, okay? So, but if you just want to um, make a certain variant, so you can say step equal to two or step, step colon, step colon, and you can write like var equal to var plus two, okay? Uh, or var colon equal to var times two, okay? Because maybe this is your for loop. So each time you are gonna multiply your variable by two and do something, okay? Um, we can accept the, the step keyword in addition to what we learned so far, just in case we need it, okay? So most probably you won't need it, but just in case you want to change your incrementation um, uh, or variable change process or your step, okay? Then you can write this keyword and show, show us your step. No, no, it's, a, it's just a keyword. In, 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 in many programming languages, they allow you to define the step, okay? Uh, sometimes you want to go backward, so maybe your step is equal, is defined as follows, is variable equal to the previous value of the variable minus two, okay? Maybe you want to go backward the three steps or two steps each iteration, okay? But in the worst case, if you have a very complex condition, then write it as a while loop, okay? And end the discussion, yes? Yeah. Uh, be because we can define complex steps, I would recommend this this way. Okay, don't use the previous one. Because we may define complex patterns in the step, then de define it this way with column, not, not with equal, okay? If you want to define a special step, then put step column and define variable uh, uh, equal to the variable and put your formula in it. Uh, yeah, without the keyword the step, you just put it in a specific place after the for loop, and it will it is understood as being the step of your uh, for loop or iteration. Yeah, but I, I think if you are making quite a while loop in this case, it's a clearer. Okay, if you are making complex steps, okay, so put an x the square root of y and uh, uh, check whether this is equal or greater than that yeah, thing, Th then put it in. Uh, where? You mean here? In the staff. I would suggest to go with the while loop in this case, okay? So don't make it too much complex for us to understand, okay? Don't make it too much complex to understand, okay? Good. Um, so I think this is it. So, yes. <coughs> yeah. Yeah. Equal is, since we have used colon equal to assign a value to a variable, then now we are free to use the equal sign to check for equality, we don't need equal equal. Okay, good. Thank you for this question. Yes. Uh, should we, should we uh, for example, we uh, should we declare a value first with the type that or should we like a file that we just say x equals to um, If if it is really required, then do it. But I think in this course we will so often be working with numbers or integers, okay? So we want to work with characters or complex data types, okay? Okay? So, but eventually if you have Boolean values, then you can declare the, okay? So we have Boolean, uh, integers, numbers in general, decimal numbers, yeah. Is there a one question? When is our exam? The exam, it's next uh, Friday at 6 p.m. Next? Uh, this Friday. Uh, now that we are Saturday, so it's this Friday. November, November 8, I think, okay? So, yes, as usual. The, yeah. No, 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 we're gonna take a break. So, right after this one, okay? So, now that we know the syntax, can we consider ourselves the programmers? Yes, No, maybe coders, okay? But, 
um, inventing an algorithm is really um, a, a matter of uh, knowledge, skills, and the creativity. Okay? So the knowledge comes from looking at a lot of examples. Okay? So you have to learn the basics. You have to, to, like the first time someone is asking you to write a program that calculates the square root of a certain uh, integer or number, this is the first time you're exposed to this type of problems, okay? And you didn't know earlier that you have to approximate this value. You cannot really calculate it accurately. In predefined functions uh, called the square root, okay? So if you have to write yourself the algorithm that would calculate the uh, square root or the integral or the tangent, or, okay? Then you have to make a certain approximation and you have to count on the mathematical formula that defines this function, okay? Um, the first time someone is asking you to look up for a certain pattern of text within, um, within a, a large text, okay? So if you are finding a certain word, then you have to learn to do this with basic examples and programming courses, okay? Maybe data structures course. But later on, if you are asked in a certain project to make a certain code completion, you know this feature when you have to type a certain city name and they are filtering the list of cities alphabetically, okay? And they are just showing you the cities starting with the same uh, sequence of letters. Then you know that there you need to look up for the uh, part of the text that has been written in the search bar so far and to look it up and in in, in, in to search for it in your database and to get only the items that are satisfying that criteria. So what you learned in one algorithm, you can use it to solve another problem or another uh, problem. So you need to practice a lot, preferably on a computer. Absolutely, I would say not preferably, so absolutely on a computer. You need to practice on a computer, period, okay? So you have to do it because you, you need to learn the limitations of your machine and of your programming language and what they can do, what they cannot do, okay? You need to be, become proficient with the types of errors that they generate to you, okay? And to uh, debug your code. Then look at more examples and practice some more and so on and so forth, and it never ends, guys. Um, so before digging deeper on the algorithms that you want to study in this, uh, um, uh, in the next uh, session after the break, so algorithms in general, they are considered as a black box that takes in a certain input and gives you a certain output, okay? And we would like that these algorithm gives you the right output for the right input, that they not uh, uh, create a bug. Um, we mean that they are correct. They give you the right answer, okay? So sometimes they do not bug or they do not halt, okay? They simply give you a certain answer, but you are not sure whether it's the correct one, okay? Um, and sometimes they simply run forever, okay? So they get into an infinite loop, okay? We, we can easily write such code that does not deliver the right answer or uh, goes in an infinite loop, okay? Um, there are plenty of examples. Maybe you already faced such cases, okay? And after you write a correct and finite, uh, finitely executing code, um, then you have to check their effectiveness and their generality. Effectiveness in terms of uh, performance, in terms of the um, required amount of time to run, okay? So if we are playing chess with computers, then we would like to have the next move, okay? Very quickly, within one second, okay? Then we would love to spend half an hour to think about our move, but we expect that the computer is really smart and it gives us the answer very quickly. Um, Okay, it's a game, so you can wait for five seconds instead of one second, but if it is a real-time application, if it is a uh, self-driving car, then you want to know what to do with the brakes and with the um, um, acceleration at every single fraction of a second. At every moment, you need to get the final decision of your system, intelligent system, in timely, in real time, okay? So this is why effectiveness is really important. Uh, generality is to check whether it works with all the problems of the desired form. So um, 
For example, if you define a certain max function, up until now we were talking about integers. So is it true that the same code works also for uh, numbers in general, with decimal numbers? Okay? Um, so you have to check this. Uh, sample algorithm, just to conclude. So we're giving you here the code of the uh, max procedure. So we are using the keyword procedure. This is the name of the function, and this is the list of uh, arguments. We can, we can define it this way. And we could also use capital A, a list of integers, and then talk about capital A index I. So do it the way you like, okay? It's a pseudocode, guys. We're going to do the following. We're going to pick up the first element in this list and put it as the max. And then we're going to use a for loop going from 2 to n, okay? And for each element in the array, for each element number i in this list, if the element is greater than, strictly greater than the max, we're going to update that max. We're going to assign to max the value of that ai. Else, we're going to do nothing. So we just jump to the next iteration. So this is the indentation for the for loop, and this is an indentation for uh, the if statement. At the end, outside of the for loop, we're going to return the value of max. Yes, I will take your question. So we use the column as input to assign. To, 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 to copy the, the value of AI and to put it in max. Uh, equal, it just, in this pseudocode language, the equal sign would be used to uh, check the equality of values, okay? Uh, within a condition, you can write if max equal AI, if max equal AI, okay? Um, and you write just a simple equal sign, okay? If you want to assign to AI, if you want to copy the value that exists in, in the memory slot called AI to the memory slot called max, then you put colon equal. Okay? This is an assignment operator. Okay? It's fine? Okay. So, do you think that, yeah? How would you use a step of Which, sorry? If you wanted a step of Ah. So just write, uh, the code won't be correct, we agree on this, okay? But um, you, you would write for i equal 2 to n, okay? And then write a step uh, i equal to i plus 2, something like that, okay? Okay? I don't think you will need this so often, okay, in, in our course, okay? But just in case, you can, you can, you can do it this way, okay? Uh, once your step is very complex, then replace the for loop by a while loop. So let's just make this last step before the break. Yes? Uh, how? Yeah, it's, it, it's not equal uh, here. It's if max is strictly less than AI, then it means that AI is strictly greater than max. Okay, so imagine that A1 is equal to 3, okay, and A2 is equal to 4. So this condition would be true for this step. For I equal to 2, when we are looking at A index 2, we will find that A2 is greater than So the maximum is not 3 anymore. It must be 4, okay, the value of A2, okay? In this case, we have to assign to max that value, the value of A2, okay? And to assign to max the value of A2, we write this instruction here, okay? It's a, a colon equal. It's like sometimes in certain pseudocode languages, we put this, we put max arrow AI to say assign to max the value of AI, okay? Yeah. Of course, it is a loop because we have a for loop here, but inside the loop, so we are considering A2, we are considering A3, we are cons up to AN, okay? And then at each iteration, we are comparing AI, which means A2, A3, and so on, with the most recent max value that we obtained, okay? 
We, we don't have? Uh, and? Ah, yeah, I agree with you. So we don't have begin and end. Yeah, this is why I put these vertical bars. Okay, so you see, like, even us in these examples, we are not respecting the pseudocode 100%. Okay, I totally agree. Just to make the example simpler and to, so that they hold on one slide. Okay, but we had to add this begin and end on this uh, part and, and begin and end on this part here. Okay, I totally agree with you. Okay, so let's apply the definitions that we had on the previous slide on this example. Do you think that, uh, actually, what is the input of this, uh, input type of this uh, uh, algorithm? List of integers, okay, good. What is the output? It is one integer, okay, good. Um, is this algorithm correct? As long as? As long as we are dealing with integers, yes. And? And we give it a list when we call this function on condition that more than two elements, at least, at least one element, okay? It must contain at least one element. Because if, if, if you go... At least one element, I would say, and you will see why. So, um, okay. So, so the algorithm is a priori correct, but if you if you try it out with different arrays, especially if you have the array coming from different pieces of your code, okay. So maybe the array guys errors and problems happen. So if you are testing this code all the time with three values, you will get the maximum out of them. But when you launch your product or you, you send this function and maybe you are pulling a certain list of websites having a certain keyword in them and then you are sorting them by date, okay, later on or by year, okay? And what if the list of URLs that you obtain dynamically is equal to zero? There is no website talking about uh, gap, okay? Or a new keyword, okay, weird keyword, okay? Blue, 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 okay? So there is no website talking about that keyword. Then your list, okay, of years of URLs is equal to, uh, the size of it is equal to zero. You have no elements in it, okay? In this, in this case, if you write down this code and you give, you give it an empty list, it will give you an error on the line number two because you will write something like, go to a number one, go to it in the memory and put it in max. And you will be told index out of bound the exception or something like that because that index number one does not exist in the memory. Your array is empty or your list is empty. Okay, so this is what happens usually um, the side effect of your code. So and this is a special case. Okay, well when you start debugging your code this way and thinking about its correctness and checking the extreme cases. Okay, what is the maximum of an empty list of items? It's nothing. Actually, it, 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 it's nothing. Um, so maybe you want to launch yourself the exception to the developer calling your max function and telling them, sorry, we cannot compute the max of an empty list of items. Okay, maybe this is the right answer to do. Okay, so, uh, or sometimes you want to be graceful with it and to send a specific value. If, if you are checking the maximum value among a list of positive integers, then you can use minus one as a maximum value special value to denote the fact that there is no max, actually, okay? This way you will be graceful with the result, but you won't launch an exception, but you will let the developer know that there is something wrong happening in your, in, in your code, okay? Yes? At line number two, yes. You have to put an if statement, but, but even if you put an if statement, since you are expecting a return result, my question is, what would you return within this if statement? If the list is empty, then return what? Do you return zero? Maybe your developer will think that uh, finally uh, it's um, 1900, the year where this URL has been uh, posted online for that uh, word, the blue, 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 blue. Okay? 
the year one, one, 1970, or zero means 1900, okay? So zero is one of the possible results, okay? So if you have only negative integers and you have zero, then zero is the maximum. So what to return in this case? So maybe the right, the right way is to tell your devel the developer who is calling your function, or yourself, it can be yourself, that you cannot calculate the maximum of a, an empty list of items, okay? Yes, one, two. In this case, it's a tricky because uh, usually the return type, the return type is, is determined by the function uh, signature. Okay, you have to say that max the, of a certain sequence of integers return an integer, max of a certain sequence of decimal numbers return decimal number. But if you want to return uh, either an integer or a string, even though this is possible with certain programming languages, okay, that are dynamically typed. Nevertheless, this, this will be uh, often confusing for your users, okay? Because if you are using this maximum to do a certain arithmetic operation on it, and you don't check whether this is a, a string or not, then you will find an error later on. So, so often they would say that this, this function would launch an exception if the list is empty, and, the, and they will force you to, to handle this exception in your code, okay? It will become safer when you publish your, your own code calling that function, okay? Yes? Yeah, we, we, we can do this once again. So you mean the string, the string empty list, okay? But here you will have two different data types that are returned by this function. This function would either return a string or an integer. If you are using the result to sum it up with something else, okay, then you will have an exception later on, okay? The, the, the compiler or the runtime environment will tell you, I cannot make the sum of the list is empty with five, okay? Because this is a string and this is an integer. Yes? Return? We discussed this possibility. If you return zero, zero is one of the legal values of the possible valid values when your list contains only negative number and zero. If you return it as a string, it will, you are just postponing the problem till later on. If you are using the result of max blindly without checking whether it's equal to the string zero or the string the list is empty, then, then you, will, you will get an error later, later on in your code. And this, by the way, what happens when you launch a applic mobile application and it crashes, or a software and it crashes for a certain um, reason like this, okay? Just because no one did this effort to check the code correctly, yeah. I, I agree with you guys, okay? Yeah, but, but mathematically, speaking, what, mathematically speaking, what is the maximum among a list of empty integers, mathematically speaking? Nothing, okay? So you cannot, you cannot calculate it, okay? Exactly, exa I agree with you. You have to put an exception to tell the caller of your function that there is something wrong here. Your function does not accept um, uh, an empty list, okay? So this is the best solution. Uh, we don't do it in this pseudocode language, but in Java, C Sharp, C++, there are some syntax to do it, okay? But l let me answer the other questions. We have more interesting uh, discussion. Is in? Yeah. Because your function works on a list of integers that is provided from the outside, okay? Um, otherwise, you could define it to work on a global variable, okay, in your code, okay, but it, it won't be that useful. It, it will only work on that specific array, okay? It's better to make it generic in this way. Um, what about the finite, finiteness of this function? So is it finite? Does it halt always? Okay, so as long as the list is finite, which will always be the case, no programming language allow you to define infinite list of integers, okay? So usually it, it will halt, okay? So, but when you have the streams, okay? When you have the streams of data. So nowadays, nowadays algorithms work on streams of um, tweets coming from Twitter in real time, okay? 
you can create an algorithm that watches tweets of Twitter talking about Lebanese uh, revolution, let's say, okay? And you're watching this in real time, and this never stops, okay? So such an algorithm, yeah, we agree that it is not finite, and we want it to be this way, okay? It's not a big deal. But as long as your input is finite, once this hashtag will stop eventually, uh, your algorithm will also stop, okay? So this code is safe in, in, this, in this way. Um, but sometimes, guys, um, can you make this code infinite somehow by adding one instruction? Yeah? Yeah. So if you put inside the for loop an instruction that changes i back, okay, if you put i equal to i minus 1, the for loop syntax forces i to be incremented each iteration. If you decrement it once again, if you remove one from it, so actually it will stuck to 2 all the time, okay? And it will go in an infinite loop, okay? Just it will like go from 2 to 3, and then it will go back to 2, and you will repeat this, okay? It, it never ends, it never tells you what's happening. So we may fall very quickly in, in an infinite loop by adding one instruction by mistake. But this one is good, it's finite, and it's correct, okay? It's correct for lists that contain at least one element. Is it fine? Okay, so like we have four lines of code, but we could talk a lot about their correctness, about their um, uh, finiteness, and so on and so forth. And doing this for larger program, it's trickier, but um, I'm quite sure that you will develop this skill over the time, okay? So after the break, uh, we are going to run this uh, example very quickly on a certain array and check search and sorting problems, okay? Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Can I...